financial uh, resources to the media. That means the media has to, you know, seek the market profits, um, seek the income themselves. So you can see the paradox for the Chinese media reform. So on one hand, it's owned by the party. Uh, it has to follow the party line. But on the other hand, it has to follow the market line to make profits. Um, so some scholars uh, use a metaphor to describe the um, reform pro process. They call it um, dancing with the chain. Okay, so you can imagine uh, how much pain uh, it has. So I'm going to use uh, media in Shanghai as an example to show you, you know, how the market-based party organ model works in China. Uh, well, I chose Shanghai because, as we know, Shanghai is the most popular city in China, and it's going to be one of the most important cities or the, one of the most popular cities um, in the world, especially after the World uh, Expo. Another reason I chose Shanghai because Shanghai is one of the most uh, I'm sorry, it's one of the earliest cities in China uh, which adopted the media conglomeration policy and the media reform policy. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, media in Shanghai from three perspectives to show you, you know, how the model works. So the first pr uh, perspective is media conglomeration. I'm going to talk about the city situation of media conglomeration in Shanghai. Then I'm going to talk about you know, uh, how the resources within the media conglomer conglomerates uh, are allocated. And then I'm going to focus on the reporters within each media organization and talk about media professionalism in China. Um, while media conglomeration uh, was a policy uh, started to be adopted by China um, in late 1990s, and it has been strengthened uh, after China joined uh, the World Trade Organization. Well, uh, media conglomeration in China is um, different from here uh, because in China, uh, the state or the party is the biggest stakeholder um, within the media conglomerates. Uh, and the party has the authority, has the monopoly, you know, to decide how to use the resources. Uh, and it also makes the policies um, for the media. Well, today there are three big media conglomerates in China. Uh, there are Wenhui Xinning Press Group, uh, Jiefang Daily Press Group, and Shanghai Media um, Group. Well, uh, actually, Wenhui Xinning are two uh, individual newspaper papers. So that is Wenhui Daily and Xinning Evening. Uh, I'm going to talk more about them later. Uh, so those two newspapers combined or merged with each other and formed uh, the Xinning, Wenhui Xinning Press Group. Um, well, Jiefeng Daily, well, Jiefeng in Chinese means uh, revolution. So you can imagine, you know, uh, the property of the newspaper. So Jiefeng Daily uh, was also, uh, is also a very important newspaper in China. Uh, and it formed a press group. And the Shanghai Media Group was um, formed by, you know, combining um, Shanghai television station um, and Oriental um, television station. So these are the three big uh, media conglomerates in Shanghai today. Uh, well, as I said, Wenhui and Xinmin. Uh, okay. Well, uh, Wenhui and Xinmin actually are two indi uh, individual newspapers. Um, in the late 1990s, um, Xinmin Evening, the second newspaper, um, was a huge success in Shanghai. Um, it's different from uh, the traditional party newspapers like People's Daily uh, or Jiefang Daily, etc. Uh, it provides the short, shorter uh, and softer, softer news stories to the readers. Uh, so it attracted uh, a very wide range of readers. Um, so they said that their readers ranging from age 8 to age 80. Uh, so it was a great success. And also its advertising revenues were also very impressive. Um, in 1999, um, it attracted about 100 million uh, US dollars, uh, ranked the second nationally. Well, because Xinmin Evening was so successful, uh, well, Wenhui Daily was not so successful. Uh, so the government decided um, or forced those two newspapers to be merged with each other 
um, in 1998. While shimmy evening was so success, successful and one way data was kind of normal or average newspaper, so somebody described their merge as you know, um, a bare bottom man embracing a lady in a mint coat. Yeah. And the party decided to use multiple strategies to promote uh, this press group or to promote you know, these two newspapers. Well, one strategy they took uh, is the bundling advertising policy. That means uh, the advertisers, if they decided to buy the advertisement from one newspaper, they have to buy the advertisement from another newspaper as well. And also, they um, raised the price for the newspapers. Well, each newspaper's right, uh, price was uh, raised for about 30%. Uh, so actually, um, these two strategies um, turned out to be a failure because uh, the bombing advertising policy actually um, made you know, the advertisers um, decided not to buy the advertisements from either newspaper. Uh, and uh, raising the prices um, you know, made a lot of readers decide to uh, not to buy the newspaper anymore. So it turned out to be a failure rather than a success. Then then now I'm going to talk about you know, how um, the media conglomerates um, allocate their resources within uh, the uh, news organizations. Well, as I said, you know, the party um, had the authority to decide how to allocate their resources. So they decide how to use the profits, how to use the assets, etc. And also different from the Western media, in China because the government is trying to avoid uh, the social instability. So that means even some reporters, they are not so qualified um, for the positions within the news organizations. Uh, the media outlets are not allowed to lay off those people because you know if there are too many layoffs, uh, the social instability uh, will increase. So they're not allowed to do that. Uh, another interesting thing is about the uh, special financial tasks for um, Chinese media conglomerates. Well, you can look at the beautiful picture uh, on the top. It's a picture of the Chi uh, Shanghai Opera House. Um, as a successful uh, media conglomerate, uh, the Shanghai Media Group is required to provide financial support to build the ho opera house. Uh, and they are also required to, provi to provide some money uh, to build a performing company, uh, an exhibition company, uh, an art theater, uh, etc. So that means actually the government, the party, gives the media organizations a lot of external um, tasks, you know, uh, which, are, which has nothing to do with the um, news organizations. So in that environment, how do the reporters feel? Uh, well, as we know, media professionalism uh, requires the reporters to take an independent or critical approach um, towards the events. However, um, Chinese um, reporters in China, they have the uh, tasks from the party, from the government, and also they have the financial tasks. So um, it's pretty hard for um, the Chinese reporters to um, you know, uh, reconcile their um, professional ideals uh, with the party line. So some reporters or uh, some media workers, they have learned you know, how to do the self-censorship before uh, the news go out. Um, and also, it's important for the top media managers you know, to keep a very good relationship with the um, top government or top authorities in the city. You know, um, just in case that something unhappy happens, uh, it can be um, resolved you know, very smoothly. So how about the job certification, certification among Chinese reporters? Um, are they satisfied with their job or not? Uh, well, Chen Pan Li, uh, the three Chinese scholars, um, they launched the survey uh, in Shanghai in 2004. Uh, they got about more than 500 uh, reporters in Shanghai uh, from traditional media um, to do the survey about job satisfaction. 
uh, the reporters are composed of both um, newspaper reporters as well as broadcast media reporters. Um, well, from this chart, you can see that um, Chinese reporters actually, they're pretty satisfied with their supervisor's ability uh, as well as their relationships with the colleagues. Uh, they're kind of moderately um, satisfied with their impact of the work. Uh, and also their sense of achievement in their work is also kind of uh, moderate. Uh, and also uh, same for the opportunity for creativity. Uh, however, their satisfaction with their income and compensation with their all kinds of benefits um, are very low. Uh, and also, they are not satisfied with their chance of promotion. They think that there are very little chance to get promoted. Um, so basically speaking, their um, job satisfaction is um, you know, uh, around three um, on a one to five scale. Uh, it's above average. Well, this study um, focuses on the macro perspective job satisfaction uh, or journalist's work. Uh, we are more interested in a more micro perspective of um, reporters. We want to know, you know how anxious or how much pressure the reporters feel when they produce the news stories. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, we did an experiment with both Chinese reporters and uh, American reporters. Uh, we, compare, we compared uh, their anxiety level when they produced the news stories. Uh, well, actually, we got four different kind, uh, types of reporters. They are the Chinese domestic reporters, <coughs> excuse me, um, Chinese foreign reporters, American domestic reporters, and American foreign reporters. Uh, we totally got 120 participants, so uh, we have um, 30 people in each cell. Um, so we asked them to write um, three news stories about emergencies. And after they finished writing the news stories, we gave them a questionnaire um, asking them you know, how anxious they felt uh, when they writing the news stories. Um, well, from this chart, you can see that, uh, well, maybe it's not so clear. On the x-axis is nationality. Uh, the green line represents the domestic reporters. And the blue line represents uh, the I'm sorry, the blue line represents domestic reporters, and the green line represents the foreign reporters. Uh, so you can see that um, Chinese reporters um, generally experienced much higher level of anxiety uh, than, their, than the American reporters you know, when they write the news stories in emergencies. Uh, actually, the journalistic beats doesn't make a difference. Uh, there's no, different, uh, no significant difference uh, you know, within uh, different beats. So it seems that you know Chinese reporters they uh, felt more pressure, uh, more anxiety, you know, than American um, counterparts. Then that's the situation about the you know the traditional media, um, broadcasting and uh, um, print media. Uh, so how about internet? Well, uh, I think I don't need to explain. Uh, um, actually, China um, Chinese government. Uh, exerts you know um, strict re regulation on the internet. Um, however, uh, at the very beginning of um, the internet development, uh, there's no regulation on in the internet uh, in China. Uh, the first set of regulations you know uh, was announced in 1996 um, after the Chinese government felt that you know. Uh, some information on the internet is kind of you know threatening or negative towards the government, so they started to you know uh, regulate the internet. Well, they take you know several strategies to regulate the internet. But well, first of all, if someone wants to you know um, establish a website you know uh, for the central news unit, they have to get the license from the central government. So that's the one way to regulate um, the internet. Well, another way is you know uh, the controlling the source of the information. Uh, for example, the government required that uh, the commercial news websites uh, like Soho or Yahoo. Uh, dot com uh, they don't have the right to do independent interview or news reporting. Uh, that means they have to use uh, the information um, from the traditional official news uh, media. 
um, they are not allowed to uh, interview or you know cover the news events independently. So with the background I've just talked, you know, um, Chinese media, you know, they're going to seek more uh, financial profits. So um, unavoidably, um, they are going to lower their ethical standard. And uh, meanwhile, uh, the internet uh, is disseminating a lot of, you know, false or fabricated information. So uh, the media credibility turns out to be an issue in China now. Uh, for example, in 2006, um, the Chinese Academy of Social Science, they conducted a survey, and they found that uh, news that is bought or fabricated uh, accounted for about 6% of the total number of the news stories in that year. So that's um, pretty um, impressive. Uh, well, meanwhile, um, some scholars identified that uh, with the new media, with the internet, uh, there are four different types of media paradigms in China. Uh, the first paradigm, we call it professional media. Um, a good example of uh, professional media is um, Southern Weekend. Um, well, Southern Weekend is a newspaper um, based in Guangdong province. It's famous for its investigative um, journalism coverage. And it disclosed a lot of, you know, um, corruptions or negative sides of the society, etc. Um, so undoubtedly, you know, uh, it has been cracked down by Chinese government for many times. Um, another example of professional media is the Phoenix TV. Uh, well, Phoenix TV um, actually is owned by the um, the news corporation, um, so it's a transnational um, TV station. It is based in Hong Kong, not in uh, mainland China. Um, well, in the early years of Phoenix TV, uh, it also provided many independent um, news coverage. And it's famous for the independent approach uh, and also for its entertainment programs. So, you know, because of those kind of reasons, uh, Phoenix TV actually um, is forbidden in China for um, quite a while. Um, when I was still in Beijing, um, only the universities and the five-star hotels um, could receive the signal of Phoenix TV. Um, but what is interesting with uh, Phoenix TV is that it is based in Hong Kong. Um, however, uh, it only broadcasts the programs in Mandarin, not in Cantonese. Uh, so it actually cannot attract the local Hong Kong um, audiences. Because the local Hong Kong audiences only, you know, they speak and they understand Cantonese. They don't watch Mandarin TV programs. Um, so that means the main market for Phoenix TV actually is in mainland China. But because mainland Chinese, uh, Chinese government is forbidden um, Phoenix TV, so it lost a lot of audiences, you know, in uh, late 1990s and early um, 20, um, 2002 or some, uh, sometime around that. So, Due to that kind of reason, Phoenix TV is actually um, changing its um, covering um, strategy. So it becomes, it becomes you know, uh, less and less independent um, and is less and less critical now. So um, some people call the Phoenix TV as another channel of CCTV now. Uh, so, um, but anyway, uh, it's still a very influential and uh, kind of independent media in China. Well, the third example of professional media is called Taijing. Uh, it's a financial news magazine in China. Uh, it's also famous for its uh, investigative news reporting. Uh, it also disclosed a lot of corruptions, you know, uh, the negative signs of the society, etc. Uh, it was, um, it became, you know, uh, more popular or more famous during SARS because it did a very extensive coverage of SARS in the very early stage. Um, so, you know, due to that reason, um, the Chinese government has uh, forbidden Taijin for many times. Uh, so these scholars think that uh, these three media outlets actually um, is the example of professional media because they are acting more professional, more independent, et cetera. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but um, so are they all um, owned outside the party, or are they partially owned by the party? 
Um, for Phoenix TV is owned by um, News Corporation. Pure, yeah, report, yeah. Um, Taijin and Southern Weekend, I think they are also owned by, they are not independently owned by, you know, um, personal companies or, I think they, private, yeah. Okay. Yes, so, yeah. Well, the safety media paradigm they identified is uh, the traditional party organ media, like the People's Daily, uh, CCTV, et cetera. So it's pretty easy to understand. On uh, the third journalism paradigm, they um, identified is called the official news websites. Uh, that's the news websites of the traditional media, like the website of People's Daily, the website of Xinhua News Agency, et cetera. Uh, the third type of media paradigm they found is called the commercial news websites like Yahoo or Soho, you know, those kind of commercial uh, websites, you know, which also deliver the news information. So um, we launched a survey in Beijing um, two years ago. Um, we want to compare, you know, or we want to find out, you know, um, people's perception of the credibility of those four types of um, media par paradigms. Um, so we got 376 college students um, to do the survey. Well, the reason we chose college students is, uh, well, one reason is they are the new technology adopters, so they are more likely to read the online news, you know. Uh, they are more familiar with all kinds of websites. Another reason is, uh, as I said, you know, for Linux TV, usually can only be received um, in the universities on campus and in the five-star hotels. So we think that um, college students, you know, they are more exposed to Phoenix TV compared with the general public. Um, so we give them a list of uh, the news outlets, uh, and we ask them, uh, you know, how credible do you think the information on these news um, uh, outlets have? So here's the um, chart of the results. You can see that. Uh, the professional media, which includes the Southern Weekend, Phoenix TV, um, had the highest score of credibility. So they treated those two media outlets as most credible. Uh, followed by Xinhuanet.com, which is the official news website of Xinhua News Agency. Uh, then followed by CTTV. Then um, Taijing, another um, professional media, is considered as, as very um, credible. Uh, then followed by people's.com.cn, uh, people the website of People's Daily. Uh, followed by you know, People's Daily, the um, party organ media. Then the commercial news websites um, received the lowest um, credibility score. Then we combine you know, each type of media um, outlets together. So you can see that the professional media, which includes the summer weekend, um, Phoenix TV and Taijing, um, it had the highest credibility score. Uh, the official news website, uh, which is the website of People's Daily, and the Xinhua News Agency, it's very interesting, they also received a pretty high um, credibility rating. Uh, both of the party organ media and the commercial news websites, um, their credibility rating was pretty low. Uh, much lower than the professional media. Uh, we think, um, well, it's no doubt that the professional media is considered as very credible. So what's the reason, you know, for the official news websites to be considered as so credible? Well, we guess that there are maybe two reasons. Well, the first reason is um, compared with the traditional party organ media such as People's Daily and the Xinhua News Agency. Um, you know, the website actually they received much less um, control from the government. Um, so that means they probably have more freedom in their coverage. Uh, but compared with the commercial news websites such as Yahoo and Soho, uh, because uh, they are affiliated with the party organ media, so that means maybe their um, information is more credible. Their you know, reporters are more um, qualified, more credible, et cetera. So I guess that's the reason you know, why official news websites also receive pretty high um, credibility rating. Um, so this is a um, credibility issue, some um, traditional media. Well, another issue I want to talk about the Chinese media is the um, 
westernization or internationalization. We know that um, China is more and more China is more and more westernized. Um, so as Chinese media, um, well, we have incorporated a lot of TV program genres from the Western world, like talk shows, uh, sitcoms, reality TVs, etc. Uh, well, I'm going to show you a short video before I talk. Uh, Well, do you think the singer is a boy or a girl? <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's a boy or a girl? Girl. Girl. Yeah. A weird girl. Yeah, weird Chinese girl. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, this is the singer. Uh, she was the winner of the um, Super Voice Girl a reality TV show in China in 2005. Um, and this is the runner-up of that show. You can see that actually, I mean, if I don't know their identity, it would be hard for me to tell whether they are female or male just looking at, you know, these two pictures. It's so different from the Chinese girl. Um, well, the reality show, which is called Super Voice Girl, um, started in 2004. Uh, it has been considered as a very revolutionary TV program in China. Uh, it's revolutionary in two ways. Well, first of all, it's a very revolutionary um, TV program genre in China. Because um, before Super Voice Girl, they thought that uh, actually there is no real uh, reality show in China. Uh, that means you know um, the criteria to show up you know on TV is very very high. Um, but Super Voice Girl is called the Chinese American Idol. That means you know, no matter how old you are, uh, whether you are pretty or ugly, you know, whether you are tall or short, or you know, uh, you have the right to participate um, in the program, uh, participate in the competition, uh, and no professional training or skills are required. Um, and on the other hand, um, the winner uh, was not only selected by the TV station. Uh, Every single audience, they can vote for the um, singers uh, through text messages. So it attracted uh, a lot of audiences back in 2005, and uh, the advertising revenues uh, is kind of sky high. Um, so that's revolutionary. Uh, somebody called the Super Voice Girl as the first participatory TV program in China. And another interesting thing about this program is um, the singers, uh, who are girls, uh, are very revolutionary in their appearance. Because, um, because Chinese girls usually uh, are portrayed as you know, very submissive, 
very oriental with long hair, you know, uh, wearing skirts, you know, uh, very traditional. However, the girls showed up in that competition um, look like boys. They don't look like the traditional um, Chinese female. Uh, well, as you know, China, China is uh, widely influenced by Confucianism, and Confucianism required female to be submissive to uh, her father, to her husband, and also to her son. Um, but the singer or the winner of the competition think that they don't like wearing skirts or um, the audience don't like them. Well, the audience, they thought that the audiences voted for her because she looks revolutionary. Uh, she looks different from other um, Chinese girls. And some interview with audiences found that uh, the audiences like the singers because uh, they don't wear skirts, they don't use the lipsticks, uh, they don't look sexy, they are um, different. Yeah. Uh, so they feel excited and crazy um, for the girl. Uh, well, this is the third, uh, I'm sorry, this is the second runner-up. Uh, actually, somebody thought that uh, her voice is much better than the winner and the um, runner-up, but she only received the third prize. Uh, the reason because, you know, they thought that, you know, um, a lot of young people, they like the winner rather than the traditional girl uh, with long hair, with sexy body, etc. Uh, but even with this girl who looks very traditional Chinese, uh, the media portrayed her as a very independent girl, a uh, very bravery girl, because um, her father died very early when she was like 10 years old or 15 years old. So she grew up with her mother only, uh, and she had to quit from the school and go to uh, and went to sing in a bar, uh, you know, to get some money. Um, so after a couple of years, you know, um, after singing in the bar for a couple of years, um, she had to go back to the college and finish the education. Uh, so the media also portrayed her as very independent. Uh, and also she was invited to um, the opera show last year, actually. Um, if you can see her performance. No, it's a different one. It's a little bit slow.
show called The Mongolian Cow Sour Yogurt Supergirl. Yeah. Jane was chosen on the spot. those high notes, earned her the nickname the Dolphin Princess. Well, I think we can escape part of the video. It's not so important here. So you can see that, um, well, uh, you can see the westernization of Chinese media. Well, I think my time is going to um, finish. So my topic is many faces of Chinese media, but I'm pretty sure I only covered several faces. So uh, I believe there are more interesting stories uh, we can talk about. So I would be happy to discuss with you after the talk. Thank you very much.